All right, friends, Romans, countrymen, everyone come forward, please. And if you would, I, I'm sorry to have to ask this. We're gonna love to get your attention because there's four fabulous people you're gonna wanna hear from. All right, so welcome. It's great to see everyone. We know this is the capstone to what I hope has been a fabulous day already. Um, welcome back to campus, welcome to campus. My name is Paul Hare, I run the Harvard Grid. It's a brand new organization in the engineering school collaboration between the Office of Technology Development and the School of Engineering to shape and lift more of Harvard science and engineering out into the world for impact. So the idea is to get more ideas from labs into startups uh, to help shape the world. And specifically, um, we all have a common thread in which that interest is the impact on how we develop a more uh, livable world. And there's many aspects of how that works. It puts less bad stuff into the environment, take bad stuff out of the environment, figure out how to measure what we're doing, um, but also figure out how to just survive. So um, mitigation and, and, and dealing with the environment that, we will, uh, that we're encountering today and going forward. And you're gonna hear from four students, one former, or one recent graduate, I should say. We're gonna hear from four uh, students that have decided to take their life, take their passions, apply it, uh, some, take a science or technology idea and figure out how they can have big impact and shape what's going on in the world. So many ways to approach this, but I think you know, the, uh, the idea we thought would be most fun is to kind of take a look at a continuum of what is going on in labs, how we're looking at developing these ideas in the labs, figuring out how to build them, how to characterize them, how to turn them into uh, ideas that can have impact stepping forward into where we are potentially and launching them. Um, then ideas that are shaping into business plans, getting funding and looking at customers, and then those that might be already out in the world and uh, working with customers uh, um, in a more meaningful way with LOIs and, and such. So I think you know, that is one way to look at it, but I think another way if you, uh, to hear what's going on here is the is sort of, we'll look to the heavens. Uh, the, the ideas that you're gonna hear about one is a photophoretic levitating device that navigates itself in the, uh, in the um, mesosphere, if I get that right, actually. Um, the next idea is uh, geo solar geoengineering. If you heard from our uh, engineering faculty member, Frank Koich earlier today, talked a bit about solar geoengineering. Um, so this idea of uh, how we put um, organic aerosols in the atmosphere and what effects that they may have to help mitigate the effects of global warming. And then we come down to the terrestrial or the troposphere, where we'll hear a little bit about uh, technologies to uh, manage agriculture in a way that is more sustainable to not only provide uh, food supplies, but also to, uh, to manage our resources much more effectively. And then finally, um, a term you heard here, the aquasphere. So looking into the waters and how we that live right by the ocean can survive and navigate a world that is ever changing. So that's the theme. Um, maybe why don't we start in the aquasphere and we'll work our way up to the heavens. And I'd love to introduce Alex Berkowitz. And what we'll do to start with is to hear from each one of our four students um, or recent graduates to, uh, to hear what they're doing and then we'll come back to lots of other ideas if we may. Alex, please tell us what you're up to. Okay, hi. Ooh. I have a loud voice and this is, this is pretty serious. Um, it's so nice to see everyone. Um, my name is Alex Berkowitz. I'm the founder and CEO of Coastal Protection Solutions. Uh, we help protect coastal communities uh, by a product called the Wave Breaker, which is a 300 foot wave speed bump that decreases the height and velocity of waves uh, so that it um, doesn't, the waves don't get to shore and uh, destroy property and lives. And while doing that, it creates, uh, produces uh, wave energy, so. Terrific, thank you. All right, let's take the next step up to the uh, troposphere. So let's hear, Max, what you're up to. Hi, everyone, I'm Max. I am an MSMBA student currently at Harvard. Uh, I'm a co-founder and COO of Agex, and we build devices that make livestock farming more efficient and sustainable. So our, our flagship device, the Ag Muster, is a collar for cows um, that can virtually fence them and virtually muster them to enable graving, uh, grazing techniques that reduce carbon emissions by about 30%. 
Terrific. Thank you, Max. Let's go one step up now into the stratosphere. Please, Corey. My name is Corey Peterson. I am a PhD student in the engineering school. My research is focused on understanding the chemical kinetics of aerosol particles in the stratosphere. This includes naturally occurring aerosols, but also man-made aerosols for the purposes of solar geoengineering. So my research is focused on reducing the uncertainty of uh, injecting these particles into the stratosphere as a form of uh, climate engineering. Fantastic. And Ben, before we get to you, just I had to learn all this before we started too. So the aquasphere, I think we all understand, is our oceans. I think the troposphere, which is sort of terrestrial in the first so many kilometers. Tell us what is the stratosphere? Yeah, the stratosphere is the portion of the atmosphere that is about 10 to 18 kilometers from the surface. Okay. Sometimes airplanes fly in there only on very like high latitude, but generally nothing is in the stratosphere. Got it. Thank you. And then let's go one level. Tell us what you're up to. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me, and thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Ben Schaefer. I'm a recent PhD graduate from School of Engineering here, um, and I'm the co-founder of Microavionics. So we are developing a new propulsion mechanism that enables flight in the mesosphere. So that's one layer up from the stratosphere, and it's a region of the atmosphere that nothing else can fly. It's too high for planes, but it's also too low for satellites. Um, our devices levitate in this region of the atmosphere using no onboard power or photovoltaics or fuel um, through kind of an obscure physics mechanism called photophoresis. And uh, we are going to use these platforms as a way of collecting climate data in this region. And that climate data is very novel because nothing else can fly there. Fantastic. And <clears throat> I think for sort of the next step, by the way, audience participation. These mics are mobile. So you guys know what, who Jerry Springer is or was in the show that he used to, to host? So that is going to be the format. So no one is going to be safe. All right. So when we're done here having a little discussion, we'll be coming around. I would love to know what is on your mind. You're going to hear a lot less talking from me and a lot more talking from you. So think about what you would like to ask to these wildly impressive students, uh, given the work that they're doing and how it will have impact. Um, before we do that, why? What is it that uh, sort of motivates you to do what you're doing? You have degrees to take you anywhere and to do anything. Why is it you're focusing on what you're doing? Ben, let's, let's go in reverse order. Sure. So um, I actually got into the science behind what we're doing at Microavionics um, through entering uh, my grad school research studying geoengineering, what Corey's working on. Um, my advisor at the time uh, had written a paper that talked about using engineered structures for geoengineering um, that could be used as basically little mirrors to reflect sunlight back into space, rapidly cooling uh, the Earth's surface. And they would, uh, th these particles would hover in place using the same mechanism that we are now. Um, we just asked the question, could you use the mechanism of, of this levitation to loft something bigger than an aerosol particle? And recently in lab, we found the answer to be yes. I started studying this because I was passionate about using physics, which is my, what my background is, to solve some of the most pressing issues in climate change. And it turned into um, something that could not only be commercially viable, but also have a dramatic impact on collecting climate data and thus influencing the way we look at climate models and, uh, and weather prediction. Terrific, thank you. Corey. How did we get to the idea of solar geoengineering and why you? I've always been very interested in the climate system and a lot of the discussion around climate change and climate system is rather depressing. Uh, it's pretty obvious what's going wrong and a lot of the conversations about what will go wrong, when it will go wrong, things like that. And so solar geoengineering is very exciting to me to um, not be part of a solution, but be part of a response to climate change and um, hopefully produce some good through it, whether or not my research says to do it or to not do it, but hopefully be able to give policymakers the information they need to make an informed decision. Wow, all right, terrific, very exciting. Max, how did you stumble upon this idea of corralling cows? Um, yeah, so I love food. Um, I think you know my my favorite thing to do in life is is cook with my brother and host dinner parties. I um, 
I worked for a few years in aerospace engineering, and around that time, I was getting a little bit disenchanted with the industry. Um, I was spending a lot of time at farmer's markets, and I went to a small vertical farm in Brooklyn. We were growing uh, salads in a warehouse, and that's kind of where it clicked. The, the passion and the science and the engineering all kind of came together. Um, and so I, I left the, the vertical farm after three years and started building in the uh, kind of other side of agriculture, animal ag. Fantastic, all right. So now, we heard that Ben is developing a device that photophoretically, it levitates itself. There's no power, there's no motor. The device just hovers. Do you believe that? Yeah? All right, prove it. So I think in all cases, Alex is talking about mitigating large waves before they crash and do damage on the shore. Um, Corey is talking about sort of reinventing a full layer in the atmosphere so that we have less of the damaging sunlight that, that ultimately might enter the, uh, the lower regions of our atmosphere. And finally, Max, you're talking about training and managing animals in a way that is not only sustainable for the environment and, and for the grass, but also for the animals themselves. What do we think? Is that possible? My classmate, Gracie Amos right here, my classmate from uh, business school. What do we think? Thank you. <laughs> what are the short-term gains? Fabulous question. Short-term gains. Another way to ask that is like, what is the impact of what you're doing? Is this something that is meaningful, scalable? How do you think about that? Please, who would like to kick us off? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Because um, this was a, a huge part of kind of our journey and, and figuring out what our first product was actually going to be, right? So we, um, we, we looked at livestock farming and some of the, the big numbers are ominous, right? So livestock agriculture is 11 to 20%, depending on the data of global carbon emissions, right? And uh, meat consumption is gonna nearly double by 2050. So we saw these like huge numbers and got really excited about the impact. Um, but that's not what gets, you know, farmers on the phone with us. Um, and so we actually started with uh, biomonitoring for cattle. And we were trying to build devices that would alert farmers when a cow was going into labor or if they were exhibiting early symptoms of disease. And we we're kind of trying to find like the right on-ramp that would immediately hit the farmer's bottom line. And it took trial and error. Um, we, built, we, we built some of these devices. Um, we built, you know, like quick, sloppy landing pages, collecting information from farmers. Um, and then what, what found it was, was virtual fencing, where we figured out um, rather than 15% of, of global emissions, the number that mattered, mattered to the farmer was $10,000 to build a quality kilometer of fencing. And we could do it for, you know, 20 bucks per head of cattle. And so that's kind of where it clicked, where we said, oh, that's the, that's the overlap between the long-term impact and our kind of vision for the future and immediately being useful and practical and cost-effective for a farmer. Fantastic. And Alex, I think one, if that same question, but maybe could we frame it slightly differently, which is this idea of when you start with a technology or you start with a problem, innovation often happens much, it's much simpler to do innovation if you start with a problem and then you figure out how to apply technology. And I think that's what you did. So where is uh, Coastal Protection Solutions in terms of where you are in the life cycle of a company? And what are you uh, about to sign as I just recently learned? Great, so um, I just wanted to uh, start by kind of communicating to everyone what my backstory is and the reason why I'm trying to, you know, uh, diminish 20, 30 foot waves. Um, it does not come from uh, just being at Harvard. Uh, in 2012, my hometown of Rockaway Beach, New York, was devastated by Hurricane Sandy. And uh, my parents had eight feet of water in their basement. 
And so after I uh, pumped that out, <laughs> I went to the beach, which is only two blocks away, and saw massive devastation. And I said at that moment that I didn't want this to happen to any other community uh, going forward. So that was in 2012, and fast forward 12 years from now, um, we have signed an LOI with a community in Cape Cod. Uh, they're having massive erosion problems. So this is the, the near term. <laughs> is, uh, the far term is we're trying to save people from hurricanes uh, due to climate change um, and typhoons, um, and also provide them with clean, clean wave power. Uh, but what we've been finding actually has been really fascinating. Um, people, the communities that are interested in our product are interested in it from an erosion standpoint. So there's a community in Cape Cod that is losing so much sand that it costs them a half a million dollars per year to replenish their beach. And so we're going to be working with them uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And in fact, just a couple of days ago, um, and this was really cool, uh, I got an email from a gentleman in Egypt, uh, about 20 miles uh, outside of Alexandria, that had a, uh, a community that also was facing erosion problems, the same exact problems that were happening you know, over in Cape Cod, and he was looking for the wave breaker as a solution. Alex, I, that's, I, I find that super exciting. This is not a problem that we think, you said the word near term. This is not something that's sort of tomorrow and, and next week. This is a problem that has happened and been happening now for a long time. And you've come with almost the only solution that might have a chance of really helping them out and preventing, like you said, maybe not having to replenish the sand as it were. Ben, how are you thinking about impact and you know these levitating devices that you're developing? How, uh, how will they be used and how will they have impact, do you think? Yeah, so there's, um, there's two ways we're looking at it. The first is mitigation. So uh, in the long term, our devices could be used as uh, not only a way of collecting new climate data, but also performing telecommunications. Um, and they could do that. They have, they have certain benefits over, say, low Earth orbit satellites like Starlink. Um, but because of their unique levitation mechanism, they don't consume any fuel or, uh, or need any power to hover in place. Um, because they're also lower in the atmosphere, they require a lot less energy to get up there. And so they're a greener form of, uh, they could be a greener form of telecommunications than say a, a low Earth orbit constellation. Um, the other way we look at it is through adaptation. And that really is in that the data that we collect uh, in the mesosphere could be used to improve climate models, uh, weather prediction. All uh, those things have downstream effects on a huge number of industries, including agriculture, aviation. Um, we're even looking at insurance um, as one of the major uh, consumers of the data that we collect. So I think there's two different ways of looking at it, and both of them could have significant impacts. Probably, uh, it's, a it's less clear to quantify those impacts, uh, you know, compared to something like a, a speed break where you can see the fiscal benefit that a, a town that uses them might have. Um, but yeah. That's, I think it's very clear to see how that's quantifiable. Thank you. Corey, your work with these uh, microparticles or these particles, these organic aer aerosols, how are you thinking, you know, tell, me, tell us what you're doing right now in the lab to characterize them. How are you thinking about structuring them and what their impact could be? How are you thinking and measuring those things? Yeah, so solar geoengineering is generally researched on uh, SO2, the, uh, the gas that volcanoes emit into the stratosphere. That's our natural analog to solar geoengineering. Um, but there are a lot of downsides to using SO2, such as it warms the stratosphere, um, it also causes ozone loss, and so we're looking at alternative materials that could be used to have the beneficial effects of solar geoengineering, which is reflecting solar radiation out to space, uh, but not having some of these side effects with uh, warming the stratosphere and uh, causing ozone loss. So one of the materials that we're doing research on right now are diamond particles, and they're very small. They're on the order of hundreds of nanometers, 
And essentially what we, we do is we flow them in a, a long cylindrical tube and we expose them to specific gases that we have in the stratosphere. And by understanding the reactions that happen between these gases and these aerosols, we can uh, understand how these particles will impact our ozone layer. So we're essentially looking to reduce the, or understand the risk to ozone that these alternative materials have. Corey, if I may, on the dispersion of these particles, how, how do you, is it a global, do, do we need to sort of have global coverage? Can it be regional? Do you look polar? How, are, uh, how have you thought about what makes the most sense to have the right impact? Yeah, so the stratosphere is over the whole earth and the circulation doesn't follow borders or even continent lines. So anything that we actually do in the stratosphere will be have impacts for the entire world. So it's implementation isn't something that can be really be a unilateral decision. Um, and so there are, there are a lot of different injection schemes that have pluses and minuses but all of these depend on climate models to understand how uh, the aerosols play out. Um, but we're, we, we, what we really need is observations of how this would happen, but we are still quite far from that. Thank you. And as I mentioned, I hope everyone is thinking of questions or at least a handful of people that are brave to uh, ask our brilliant uh, students and researchers here um, and entrepreneurs. And that's maybe the, the last question for me at least. Max, the... Um, this device that you have, it delivers a gentle shock to the cow, so you're able to control behavior. Where are you right now to tell us what you're doing and how you're thinking about starting but then scaling? Yeah, so as thrilled as I am to be in Boston here with you, my, um, my co-founders are also having a bit of an adventure. They're in Australia right now uh, doing some testing on a few ranches. Um, and so we're kind of in that um, transition from it works on the, on the benchtop scale in the engineering lab to actually getting these devices on, far, on farms and collecting feedback from farmers, um, at which point, you know, by the end of the summer, we're going to hopefully uh, initiate our fundraise and kind of uh, take off from there. What does that mean, fundraise? How are you thinking about that? that you know, how much would you raise and what does that buy you in terms of runway? Yeah, so um, we, you know, especially in the current fundraising climate, uh, we really prioritize, you know, fiscal sustainability. Um, we are trying to raise just a few hundred thousand dollars uh, to take us from, you know, something that I sewed myself in the engineering lab to something that we can actually productize and is, is ruggedized for a farm. Um, at which point we'll kind of onboard. We have a handful of farms who are early trial partners and using our software platform right now. Um, we will onboard them to our hardware product, uh, at which point we will, um, you know, hopefully be, be cash flow positive and able to grow via, via word of mouth and region um, and then raise against the additional data that we're going to collect over the next uh, couple months with those early customers. Fabulous. Thank you. So, friends, you have a landscape architect, a master's in landscape architecture from Harvard that's working on uh, tidal mitigation. We have a really uh, recently minted PhD, Dr. Ben Schaefer. He just defended and commenced with his PhD from Harvard just recently. Uh, yes, absolutely. That is a big deal in academia. That is, a, that is a big milestone, so congratulations, Dr. Shaver, um, who's working on solutions for uh, photophoretic levitating devices in the upper atmospheres. Max, uh, second year MBA student, working on uh, clever devices to help sort of herd cattle in a way that is a sustainable way to develop land and uh, food. And then, of course, Corey Peterson, who's working on ways to put novel devices, if we can, or novel materials in the atmosphere so that we can make this earth uh, more inhabitable. For Harvard students and researchers walk into a bar, what questions do you have for them? Very impressive. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur for, um, for, for some time, but I got a question about the cows. Um, how exactly do they respond? Is it a buzz system on them that they... Is it invisible fencing 
concept that you have there? Are you collecting geodata of just the ring being in that location? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite, I, I don't really get the, the gist of what, what you've created that someone else could not create just as easily. Yeah, great question. So I am slightly limited in what I can disclose because we're in the patent process for, for some of the technology. Um, but we've developed a, a humane stimulus mechanism that can uh, guide cows in a specific direction. Um, and that allows a farmer to essentially draw their own border um, around their property and, and we will fence the cow in and then we will um, use that same mechanism to muster the cow around the field uh, for, for intensive rotational grazing, a more sustainable grazing practice. Um, so our kind of competitive edge, technically speaking, um, is in part that, uh, that stimulus mechanism and then our uh, mesh communication network um, that uses proprietary technology that allows us to um, have a less expensive solution and a more reliable solution, especially in you know, some of the more remote parts of Australia that won't have uh, cell service, for example. Um, and so if you look at the market right now, there are some players who are trying to do virtual fencing. Um, they are banned from many parts of Australia because they use uh, high voltage uh, electric shocks, which are less humane. Um, and then they also require you know, a $50,000 investment up front for a communication tower. Uh, both of those things make the technology non-viable in our opinion. Um, and so those are, those are kind of the big differences that uh, bring farmers to the table and get them excited about the technology. Hi, Max. I'm still not clear on the ultimate objective. If you can get the cows to go anywhere you want, what is it that you're going to achieve by getting them to go wherever it is that you want? What's the end game? Sure, yeah, so, so I guess I'll put it in the perspective of a, a rancher in Australia. Um, if I am on a farm in New South Wales and I have 200 head of cattle, um, I spend about, uh, about, about $15,000 a year on simply fencing repairs and installing new fencing. Um, additionally, I'll spend you know, somewhere in the tens of thousands on labor just to muster the cows around. Um, and I'm using grazing techniques uh, that limit the productivity of my land. So you know, because cows are fairly you know, stagnant creatures, they will overgraze one portion of my grass and erode that soil. Um, and then they won't eat you know, other grass across the field. So by deploying this technology, I can actually have more cows on my farm um, and make my farm you know, more cost effective, more efficient. Um, so the, the you know, numbers based off of our initial data and research from Indiana University indicate that a farmer with only 200 head of cattle will earn about $30,000 more per year uh, by deploying this technology, saving money on fencing and improving the overall productivity of their land. They can have about 20% more cows on this land uh, by grazing them in a more efficient manner. Yeah, sorry. I understand what's in it for the farmer. What is in it for the earth? You know, we're here to, for averting climate change. What is the ultimate goal in terms of benefiting the planet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's the beauty of, of intensive rotational grazing, right? Um, so the, the most recent research that's coming out of, of Iowa and Indiana and those universities um, says that intensive rotational grazing can reduce the carbon emissions of cattle farming by about 30%. Um, and so that comes from the soil erosion, the land erosion of overgrazing parts of, uh, you know, parts of the field um, that will allow, you know, the per cow carbon emissions um, to decrease by about a third. Thanks. 
I have a question for Alex. Um, so over here, the, the idea of harnessing the power of waves has been around for a while, but one of the big problems is it's so powerful that it tends to destroy the equipment uh, that is, is used to deploy it. So I'm curious about what, uh, what innovations you're bringing to this problem so that uh, your equipment isn't wiped out by the power that you're trying to mitigate. And what's the sort of relative value of the energy production versus the, the wave impact mitigation? Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> Give me a second on that. Uh, so, yeah, the ocean is a beast. We all know that, and anyone that's working in the ocean uh, surely does know that. Um, uh, there have been reasons in the past why wave uh, energy has not worked, um, not, not just because it's been destroyed, but just because it wasn't uh, effective enough to warrant the price of it. Um, the, we are doing it much differently in a much different type of mannerism. Uh, the wave breaker is a 300 foot structure. When the wave hits, it rolls. As it rolls, there's a, that rotation creates uh, wave energy, which is, uh, the structure is actually connected with a cable and runs through to the beach which actually, I should mention this, is going to be connected to a micro uh, uh, transmitter because in my experience, we didn't have power for three months and we actually worked to rebuild our house uh, in, with lanterns. It was, I mean, it was crazy. This is in the middle of New York City. So my, my point in this and my, really my point in the wave energy is to be able to have a structure that um, allows coastal communities, many which are, uh, don't have energy very often, um, but also ones that uh, have uh, outages to get power. That's the difference. This is not necessarily a machine for making money. It will make money, but it is not, that is not the high priority here. And we are not trying to power people's air conditioners. We're trying to power, you know, um, generators and phones. So um, the second question that you had was, um, let's see, what was the second question? Can you repeat the second question that you had? I, I think you you may have answered it. It was uh, the relative value of sort of beach protection versus the energy production. That it, it sounds it sounds like you're focused on sort of emergency generation and protection more than energy generation as a, a kind of mass uh, energy source. Is that right? Yes and no. The priority is emergency. The secondary is uh, an actual energy source. And um, the, uh, the priority with the wave breaker is that we don't have to have buildings and properties destroyed and have to rebuild that because the, car, the uh, CO2 emissions that come from rebuilding is absolutely astronomical. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Um, and so the, uh, the energy portion of it is the same thing. It's trying to decrease carbon in the atmosphere. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, hi. So I have a general question for the panelists. So uh, I wonder which part of your Harvard education you feel benefit you the most uh, for your entrepreneurial career and which part of education can be improved better for future Harvard entrepreneurs? Thank you. Please, Ben. So in my experience, um, Harvard has done a really good job of providing um, kind of extracurricular opportunities for students to um, explore how their research might be applied. So for instance, um, we went to a number of the Harvard Grid events um, in the past year before we uh, really solidified on an idea, and that was super helpful. Um, I think you can come back to me on what needs to be improved, but... <laughs> Who else wants to weigh in? Maybe one other opinion? Alex, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask you only because you also spend time at the Innovation Lab. 
I don't know if you have any reflections on that. Uh... Yeah, um, so for me, uh, coming to Harvard was pivotal in the development of my product, not necessarily because I developed physically my product here, but I developed the concept. I was um, you know, allowed to go to um, incredible en engineering professors and just ask for their advice on something. Also, um, I've been involved since the beginning of uh, this journey, I would say, I hate that word, but it's true. Um, and I've been involved with the Harvard Innovation Lab, which is across the river. Um, they've been instrumental in mentoring me, pushing me forward, and also connecting me to um, even my lawyer. Uh, you know, like uh, we were just talking earlier that uh, I'm contemplating a new name for the company, and who would who would have it? But you know, to go to the Harvard, Harvard Innovation Lab and see if there's a marketing person that would work with me on that. So, you know, uh, Harvard has a tremendous amount of infrastructure for startups. I don't think that they, they get the amount of credit that a place like MIT does. So, so I have another question for Alex. Um, it has to do with hurricanes. And we live in, in Florida near the coast. And I know from people who have seawalls, which is different, you're out in the ocean, that the seawall might protect a property, but people on either side of it are hurt worse from the seawall. So what happens with your device? It's 300 feet long, I heard you say. Is there an impact on either end of the 300 feet? Is a wave wider than 300 feet? Is, does that cover the entire wave? Is it movable? Because I know when there's a hurricane coming, it's always, they think it's gonna hit here, it hits there. I mean, what, what happens actually in practice? Okay, so it is movable. It's actually considered a, a semi-temporary uh, structure. Um, that can be unscrewed and moved um, if we need to move it for uh, a season to you know, just get it out of uh, the, the view of people, or if there's um, some currents that are uh, developing that we need to move it for to optimize uh, its efficiency. So the, that's an excellent question, and I actually get that question very often regarding uh, what's gonna happen with homes that are adjacent to the, uh, the, the wave breaker. And in fact, I was in Miami about two weeks ago and spoke with, met with a innovator that's working on uh, seawalls. And so we had a really long discussion about this and um, where seawalls, um, it's a little bit difficult to explain, but the way that the wave breaker stands is not, it doesn't cover one whole space from the ocean floor to the top. It's a structure that is buoyant and sits on the top so that the water, you know, the waves could go around it. Um, but that being said, truthfully, um, we are in testing right now to make sure that we have all our neighbors of our customers covered. Um, and so we don't, won't do any harm to them. Right, thank you. By the way, if I may, everyone, um, the, this reception will continue, I think, till eight. If I could be so bold as to ask the folks in the back who wish to network, that's absolutely fine if we could keep the noise level down. Just a little bit, please. Um, this, we, we'll have to whisk away these students to another event in about 15 minutes, so bear with us. Thank you. Uh, hi, I spent Sandy in Battery Park City. And I have a curious, it comes to the seawall thing, could this, they're spending billions of dollars rebuilding the, the big wall in lower, lower Manhattan. There's a very clear economic proposition, it's called ex expensive real estate. Mm -hmm. I mean, could your device go along in front of the seawall, bulkheads get damaged, and also my second question is, is it also a tidal, does it create energy through tides? So um, the big U is one of my, uh fascinations uh, and, and bane of my existence. Uh, I actually find it very stressful because it only covers the high-end real estate and really stops right at that area, like on the east side, the lower east side, that you know has those communities that are lower income. It's not fair. And um, so the wave breaker can not only you know, help with the big U, 
Biggie doesn't need that much help. They've actually constructed it really well. I've actually met with one of the engineers that worked on constructing it. Um, they've done a solid job. What I'm concerned about are those communities that are around Manhattan or around Brooklyn that need protection and they don't have the funding for it. And that's where the wave breaker will come in because the wave breaker is actually cost effective. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Uh, I'm on the board of HPS Angels. I'm happy to talk to each of you about funding if you guys are looking for funding. I've seen thousands of startups and I'm always curious about the founder's story and the founder's journey and how mindset and purpose comes into play. Number one, I applaud you for not doing something, something dot AI, right? Because everybody's doing AI. So the question is, why are you doing what you're doing and what hope, kind of legacy and impact do you hope to leave if your company becomes a unicorn and exits after that. Let's hear from all four, please, and whoever wants to start. I'll, I'll, I'll be the chicken. Um, so, you know, earlier I was mentioning a little bit of my story about uh, the hurricane in 2012. The thing is, um, my neighborhood is a, uh, it's a middle class neighborhood. It's a very normal American neighborhood. It's, there, it's nothing in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There's nothing, it's, it's very average. And what happened to my neighborhood could in the future with climate change happen to any neighborhood in the entire world. And that's terrifying to me because there's about 500,000 um, uh, coast, coastline in the world, and about half of it is inhabited um, by cities and by towns. So my goal in doing the work that I do, and I remind myself this when the tough times go happen, because we all know if you're a startup, there's lots of tough times. And I re remind myself and I say, I don't want any other community to suffer like mine did. Whether it's in the United States or with it's in Southeast Asia, I don't want them to go through that. And if I'm a unicorn, then that means that um, we will have figured out a solution to live with hurricanes and climate change on the ocean. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, for me, you know, I, for the bulk of the time I was in grad school, um, I was viewing what I was working on as purely an academic venture. Um, and we got some really encouraging results that these structures that we're making could fly, um, you know, a year or two ago. And uh, it wasn't just me, my uh, wonderful co-founder, Angela, I uh, was also part of this journey. She's happy to take questions later. Um, but we went to a conference to share some of the work that we've done and found that people were really captivated by uh, just what doors were opened by our research. And at that moment, that, that was really when we decided to take the leap and say, let's get this out of the lab. Let's see if we can actually um, get this in the skies. Um, in terms of legacy, I think, you know, what we have here might really open up uh, a whole new region of near space uh, that hasn't been explored before. And it's not just on Earth. Uh, because our devices work in any low pressure environment, these things could also be used to explore other planets like Mars. Um, there's a tremendous amount of benefit that could be achieved by developing this technology and we're trying to see if it can happen. Um, I really love this question because my co-founders and I talk about it all the time and we see it very differently. Um, one of my co-founders grew up on a cattle ranch in Australia and was tinkering with, you know, electronic sensors on his own farm trying to trying to build things that could be useful for his family. And for him, this is all about, you know, fixing the problems that he grew up with and improving the lives of his family and his neighbors. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. I'm in it because I think 
food is incredible. I think it's, it's absolutely beautiful. I think it spans across cultures. It brings people together. Um, and the challenges around it are, are absolutely fascinating to me, where you know, the solution to how do we feed more people in a more sustainable way, it, it's so multifaceted. And you know, to, your, to your question, if this blew up and, and we exited, I mean, I would find something else to work on in the space. I think there is um, you know, huge need for policy reform in terms of the, what we subsidize and how we incentivize and support farmers. I think our personal relationship with food and nutrition is, is fascinating and, and we as, as a, a society need to think of food as grown, not made. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm in it for, for, for love of, of food and, and the community around food. My co-founder is in it for love of you know, farming and his family and his and his heritage, um, and you know, it's it's very fun to see it differently because it kind of you know we're very united around it and we we have different perspectives about it. That's that's really enjoyable. I don't personally have any startup plans. Uh, solar geoengineering is very controversial, and it is very uh, there's a lot of ethics considerations, governance considerations. So. Personally, I, at this point, I don't see a role for startups at where, while this field is so uh, young and in its infancy. All right. Um, I'm going to ask a two-part question to wrap this up. You know, and, and so forgive me, we didn't, we didn't prep this, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. One, um, which may be a little bit softer, but a uh, big challenge that you've encountered up until the point where you are in trying to get your ideas out and have impact in the world. But then the second thing is look at the audience that you have. You have people that also are very passionate about very similar things. Um, so it's a great audience of great experience, of great uh, opportunity potentially. What would you, what is your ask of this audience? Something that might accelerate your idea, get it further. Is there something that you would just want to throw out there? Maybe there's somebody who might be able to help you do it. We'll go in reverse order. So maybe Corey, you could think about what you wanted to say. Well, what I wanted to throw out is that um, part of the thrill of my job is to get to work with brilliant people like what you've heard so far. They have come up with really extraordinary ideas um, and finding that wiggle room to get them into that first market or that application or figuring out what is the sustainable model. Not, the, not only are they just sort of targeting sustainability outcomes, but the idea of how do you create a model that makes them sustainable so that it doesn't just have a small start, a small impact, and then peter out. So these are the kinds of things that I've had the pleasure to work with um, the four students and, and recent alum that you see in front of you. It has been a great thrill, and there's a lot more that's going on at the university, but uh, we personally picked these uh, four because what they're doing will have big impact, and these are the people that will see to it that it happens. So now, Corey, if I may, sort of what has big, been a big obstacle, and you might have already just said it, but what has been a big obstacle that you've, uh, you've encountered so far? And then what is it you may want from this audience, if something that could help you? Yeah, so a big obstacle is that the, the conversation or the topic of solar geoengineering is, can be treated as a taboo, that um, there's a lot of push to just not even research it, not touch it, and just call for an all out ban on doing any form of research, let alone implementation. So um, that, while I don't, ha I don't experience that hurdle personally, but that, that is certainly a very large hurdle. Um, but I, I would say my personal hurdle is that a lot of the measurements that I have to make haven't been made since the 90s when uh, we were figuring out how the ozone hole was uh, working and coming up with a uh, path forward out of that. And so basically having to dive back into the literature and figure out how all of these um, old studies have been done and uh, repeat that. A lot of the research in solar geoengineering is focused on modeling studies, uh, which use very idealized and uh, coarse models. Um, but we really have very, very few measurements of um, particles in the actual lab. And so I, that's where I see, see the need. Thank you. Max, please. Yeah, I think, um, I think the biggest challenge, and it kind of ties back to, to what I said about how multifaceted the challenges in agriculture are. I mean, the hardest part is scope. We, um, 
you know, we get so many requests from farmers and people we talk to who say, hey, this is, this is awesome. Can you also build something that does this, this, and this and fix this other problem? And, you know, as we, as we gain traction in the industry and talk to more people, um, our understanding of, of other, you know, challenges grows and we want to address those as well. And so it's more, you know, us reminding ourselves, hey, you know, we need to narrow in and hit, knock this one out of the park first, and then we'll get to all these other things that we see. So for us, there's really two big challenges. The first is, you know, coming from an academic background, um, it's, been, it's been tough to try to get away from the, um, you know, kind of academic rigor and um, style of thinking that has gone into our tech so far um, and transition to really customer forward, product forward thinking. Um, we're getting better and better at it, but it's, um, you know, it's not easy. Um, second, there's, uh, because our technology is very greenfield and nothing else can fly where we fly, um, not many people can even envision what our technology can be used for. And that kind of leads into the ask, which is, if you see a particular use case for what we're working on, please come talk to us. Um, also very niche, but if you are a climate modeler or you work with weather, with the weather data, um, tell us what kind of data would help improve what you do. We're experts on this levitation stuff, but we're not necessarily experts on what your needs are. So please feel free to come talk with us afterwards. So the biggest, um the biggest issue that we've faced is actually an issue that's been happening within this, uh, this conference, uh, which is most of the time is taken up by talking about carbon emissions or carbon sinking. And that is perfectly great and we need that. But that's gonna happen in the next, you know, 10, hopefully 10, but it's gonna happen in the future and it's not gonna be in the near future. And what we're not talking about right now is the near future and all the storms that are um, happening and increasing in severity, increasing in um, amount of them, uh, that, um, that people are getting, people are affected by this, people's lives are affected by this. And so I think if there's an ask, I would say that, um, you know, if you could be a little bit more aware of uh, the situation with resilience and perhaps uh, advocate uh, a little bit about that, you know, in, in this uh, conference, talk a little bit more about it with the person that you're sitting next to or standing next to. Uh, and then our, that, that's one ask, I have two asks. Um, the second ask is, if you know any community in wherever in the globe that is um, facing these issues that you think that the wave breaker can help, please come up to me and let me know. We are working, we're working on working global um, and looking for communities to partner with. So thank you so much. Great, thank you all. Yeah, let me go ahead, Matt. All right, if I jump in with my please, ask, please, I think I course. missed that part. A um, couple of quick asks. If you or a loved one owns cows, <laughs> come chat with us. All the cow people, yeah. raise your hand. All right, I, I, um, by the way, cows got a, a lot of interest. If, um, if, if, you're, if you are an ag tech or climate tech investor, um, like I said, we're gearing up once we have our um, you know, LOIs and, and, and sales agreements with our farmers and our trial data, we're gonna try and raise off of that at the end of the summer. Um, and then lastly, if you're interested in talking about food, <laughs> um, it's, it's genuinely what we care about um, and I'm always happy to connect on that. Great, thank you. Well, friends, listen, um, why don't we wrap up? Because you may have a, we'll have a few minutes so you can uh, t have a chance to talk to any one of our panelists. If you'd like to get in touch with them, if you go to the GRID website, grid.harvard.edu, you can find my email. I'd be happy to introduce you to any one of our illustrious, illustrious panelists. 
But um, the intent of this evening was sort of give you a little bit of an insight of how we are taking Harvard Science and Engineering, shaping it, lifting it out into the world by four fantastic examples of not only science and engineering, but people. People that have really stepped up, have embraced sort of an idea, and they, if you meet them, if you talk to them, and as you've heard them, these are the people that will make these ideas take, take life and take, take uh, uh, float. So, Corey Peterson, Max, Corey Peterson, by the way, PhD candidate in environmental engineering, Max Leaf, second year MBA at HBS, Ben Schaefer, Dr. Schaefer, just completed his PhD in uh, physics, and Alex Berkowitz, uh, Master's in Landscape Architecture. We cannot thank you enough. Wildly uh, impressive, and thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, everyone.